Dame Ethel Smythe was a person and a composer, and she had things to say as a person and a composer. She wrote the anthem that helped British women win the vote in 1918, 100 years ago today. Though Ethel Smythe was in fact a serious and prolific composer, she was known at the time in Britain mostly as a radical activist and an unapologetic lesbian. She had grand passions for a number of women, including the suffragist leader Emmeline Pankhurst, with whom she was arrested for smashing politicians' windows. As a group of their supporters sang and marched beneath the prison wall, Dame Ethel conducted them through the bars of her cell with a toothbrush. Born into a well-off military family, getting her strict father, a commander in the British artillery, to allow her to study composition in Germany was the first of many battles she waged and won in the pursuit of her passion. In Leipzig, she met and mixed with the young musical luminaries of the time who took her composing seriously. It was through them that she met the librettist, poet, and author Henry Bennett Brewster, who became her best friend, her soulmate, and, some say, even her lover. With Dame Ethel, he wrote the libretto to her opera Der Wald, The Forest, which was performed at the old Metropolitan Opera House in 1903. Smythe was the first woman composer ever presented at the Met, and she remained the last until 2016. The New York Times called the opera a novelty. Critics in Britain belittled her work, but audiences everywhere loved it. Underperformed, but undeterred, Dame Ethel went on to compose over 200 works, operas, symphonies, concertos, dozens of lieder, string quartets, and masses. Her last major work, before she lost her hearing, which ended her musical career, was a choral symphony called The Prison. This is from The Prison by Dame Ethel Smythe. This is a particularly melodious passage that I really love. One of the things I love about this passage is the text that Dame Ethel's soulmate, Harry Brewster, wrote for her when they were both quite a bit younger. He really understood her gift. I think she understood her own gift. And he wrote this text for her saying, one day you're going to, you're going to do it. You're going to be able to say what you have to say. And I feel like there's this mastery of orchestration that she had accomplished, had reached by this stage in her career. I guess it's the way she paints these words that are so personal for her. These words that are, I, I feel like, a love letter from Henry Bennett Brewster to her, and then she's somehow using his words to write a love letter back to him and yet also including all of us in the process. It's so personal, and yet it feels so universal as a result. As the soprano soloist in the prison, I have the honor of singing the soul. So it's a conversation between the prisoner and the soul, and, and as the soprano, I, I get to answer his questions, and I get to be this calm, serene voice that, that guides him through a really dark period. I've learned a lot about Dame Ethel Smythe since taking on this project, and she is a fascinating woman. About 100 years ago, she's dealing with women's rights, her place as a, as a female composer in a, in a man's world, and it has been fascinating to learn more about her story. She is a hero, <laughs> and it, is so, it so relates to the present day things we're going through with the Me Too movement and, and this sort of reckoning that we're having. I mean, it's interesting that she was having to deal with problems that women are still having to deal with today by being rejected and by being judged. Her music was judged very harshly as over-masculine. And she, I mean, she is a perfect example of the nevertheless she persisted because she had a lot working against her. And yet she created all this beautiful music and, and had a career as a woman in the arts, which is still difficult today. So she's kind of a hero. <laughs> I was browsing at the Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts, 
as I used to do copiously looking for repertoire that I didn't know, about 25 years ago in the early 1990s. And I saw a book on the shelf, Mass in D, Smythe on the Spine. I picked it up, and the opening of the Kyrie is amazing. I looked at this music, I thought, what is this? But I started looking into who the composer was and discovered this was Ethel Smythe, who I had never heard of. So after I was appointed music director of the Cecilia Gorris of New York, I reminded myself that on my to-do list in life was to give Dame Ethel a hearing in New York City. So with, uh, in conversation with the Cecilia Gorris, we decided to give the New York premiere of her Mass in D, which we did in 2013, at Carnegie Hall, Dame Ethel, at Carnegie Hall, which you deserve. At that concert, Liz Wood, who is a biographer of Dame Ethel, she attended, and she gave me as a memento a vocal score to the prison, which I didn't know about at all. I opened it and read through it, and also read the poem, which is amazing, and thought, here we go again, I want to do this piece. I really want to do more of Dame Ethel. I first became aware of Dame Ethel Smythe on a reading session that we were having two years ago. I was asked to uh, rehearse and perform excerpts from the prison. So I had studied the piece, uh, but bringing it to the first rehearsal, I was struck by the sound of the orchestration. There was something that happened during that rehearsal where it felt like the music was coming off the page and merging into the room. It was like a genie being released from a bottle. And I, I felt these shivers come over my body, like this music needed to be heard and hadn't been heard with orchestra in this country ever. I mean, it was such a striking experience. It was like, I think the people who first heard Schubert's Unfinished Symphony must have had this kind of feeling of this music that longs to be in the world and finally is. I started planning to perform the piece in its entirety the second I started hearing it in that first rehearsal two years ago. Uh, I started making plans with, with both orchestras that I conduct. So I, I began laying the groundwork and writing to the publisher and getting permission to take the manuscript, which is a handwritten manuscript, and turn it into professional, contemporary, uh, computerized engraved parts. In another context, I had done a version with piano and could feel in that chamber situation, what the piece could be in another grand garb in Carnegie Hall. So again, with the Cecilia Chorus of New York, decided that now was the time for the prison. And sometime in the spring, an email came over the transom into my inbox, and I saw that my old friend James Blatchley was going to conduct the prison in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a month before we were planning to do it. And I thought, oh boy. When I heard that Mark was planning his own premiere a month after our premiere, I was devastated because I knew how much it meant to him. And so we met a few months later, and I think we both let our hearts settle for a little while and let ourselves you know, talk to our close friends about this. And, and instead of seeing ourselves in opposition, I don't remember who proposed it, but we both came to the same conclusion that we should give a co-premiere of this piece. We should both be uh, given the, the privilege and responsibility of bringing this piece to the United States for the first time. I think for both James and for me, the piece is really about telling the truth. The prison is, is a lie. A lie is a prison. By telling the truth, you get out of prison. What could be more timely than that?